Today we're going to go over flux core wires and the flux core arc welding process. Just give you an introduction to that. What is a uh, flux core wire? A flux core wire is a wire that has flux in the inside of it. That's why it's called flux core. It's a tubular wire. Uh, it's the same as the flux that's on the outside of a stick. So you don't need a gas sometimes. Sometimes you do need a gas depending on what you're doing. If you're looking to figure out, like you have a wire at your house, you're trying to figure out what's going on, I'm, I'm going to film a chart that tells you whether you need shielding gas and the polarity at two minutes, and you can just fast forward to the two minutes and get uh, what you need for your wire. So if, you, if that's what you're looking for, go to two minutes and you'll see the uh, chart. What we're going to start with here is just an introduction. Uh, equipment, it's the same equipment as a MIG welder, except for you need a uh, knurled dry rolls, I think that's it. Just knurled drive rolls and they also put a little, it's kind of like a felt um, thing around the wire to, to clean it because it doesn't have copper on the outside of the wire. Uh, it'll look gray rather than gold and what that little uh, felt thing does is clean off any kind of corrosion from sitting in the machine too long. You know, rust, uh, something that moisture might cause. Um, setup, the way you set this up, like I just said, you have to put the knurled drive rolls in. The uh, main thing that people screw up when they put the drive rolls in is they tighten it down too tight. And what it does is it ovals the wire so it's not circular anymore. And it also lets uh, flux leak out into the liner uh, as well as the machine. And what will happen is you'll get bad feedability from both of that because the flux that leaks out will, you know, tighten down the, the liner and also the oval will make it so it goes through the contact tip rough. You want to pull the trigger, and when you can just barely stop the wire as it's coming out, that's where you want your tension on your drive rolls. Now, like I said, this is the table that shows you the shielding and polarity requirements for flux cord wires. I put a dot next to the one we're using, and you can see it says 1M there, and that M means mixed gases. So mixed gas, or that's 75, 25. I think you're allowed to range between 75 to 80. If you look down here, this is showing your external shielding, and you can see CO2 mixed, mixed, none. These are your self-shielding wires. And you can see over here, direct current electrode positive. Go down here, none. You go over, direct current electrode negative. That is the biggest mistake people make, is they have one of these wires that require you to switch polarities, and they don't do it. They have all kinds of problems, and it's, all they have to do is switch the polarities. You can see right here, again, none. Go over here, direct current electrode negative. Down here, none. Go over here, direct current electrode negative. So if you're looking for your designation, this is your, these are your uh, classifications of the wires right here. If you have a wire and you're looking to figure out what's going on with it, match it up here, go across and figure out whether you need to switch the polarity or whether you need shielding. The biggest mistake, I would say, is direct current electrode negative. All right, we'll get back to it here. Uh, safety, the main safety uh, problem with this is, is smoke. It produces a huge amount of smoke. You want to get that away from your face. It's uh, more than, I would say, stick welding. It's considerable. Uh, they actually have a lot of guns that have uh, smoke extraction nozzles right on to get that smoke off you. Uh, what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to get, um, it's kind of like in between MIG and stick. They want the productivity of MIG, or close, as close to the productivity as MIG as you can get, with the uh, penetration and the, uh, and if you're talking about being out in a windy environment, it's the same as stick. So they're trying to get it in between stick and MIG. The penetration of stick with the productivity of MIG, so it beats in the middle, that's the purpose of this. So applications for this, basically anything that uh, meets that category where you want productivity of MIG, but you need the penetration of stick. That's kind of the general purpose of this. Uh, gases, like I said before, you can have gasless wires, but you also have dual shield wires that need either straight uh, CO2 or a mixture of 75, 25, something like that. Um, advantages, we have high deposition rates um, for this. It's four times that of stick, so you're going to get four times the deposition rate of stick. Increased productivity, that's the name of the game here. Uh, good fusion, like I said, you get real good penetration. This stuff burns really, really hot. Uh, contaminants, it um, has a, 
better resistance to contaminants um, as compared to MIG welding. So you can run over some rust, you can run over some, I don't know, paint, oil, water, whatever. Um, Self-shielding, that's self-explanatory. You don't need a bottle. I mean, that's a huge deal if you don't have to lug around one of them giant bottles. Um, also, it has a wide thickness range. So you can go from really thin stuff to really thick stuff. They have a lot of 110, people have 110 welders that have a little flux cord wire in it so they don't have to, you know, lug around a bottle and for portable stuff. Disadvantages, you're stuck with ferrous and nickel-based alloys. So it has to be ferrous or nickel-based. Ferrous just means it's an iron-based uh, alloy. So you're not going to do an aluminum with this, let's say. Um, slag, just like stick welding, you've got chip slag. So that's going to you know, increase, uh, actually decrease your productivity. Um, cost, the wires cost a lot more than uh, MIG wires. But you're getting the penetration of sticks, so you kind of make that up with the production of not having to stick well. Uh, and then the safety again, the main safety factor here is fumes, smoke, things like that. I'm going to roll this up. What we're going to do in the lab today to show you how this, to get this going is we're going to start with the T-joint in the 1F position. So it's just a flat T-joint. Uh, we're going to run one of those after we get the machine set up. Then we're going to go to a lap joint, uh, the 2F, so a horizontal fill wall, just the, the lap joint flat on the table. Our wire is going to be an 045 uh, diameter wire, 045 with inches. Uh, very common wire. It requires, what we're using requires 75% argon, 25%. Uh, CO2. 045 is a good general purpose wire. It does real thin stuff. It does real thick stuff. It's, it's a nice wire to, to use. Our, our base metal is going to be 3 16 of an inch thick. And we'll go over the parameters when we get to the machine. Um, the wire. This is what the wire is uh, designated as. E71T-1M. And I just kind of broke this down here as far as what all that means. Just like in MIG, you would have ER 70S 6, let's say. Uh, e is just referring to electrode. Uh, the 7 is 70,000 pounds per square inch, uh, minimal tinsel strength. The 1 means all positions, uh, so it's basically your position. Uh, T, tubular, just means it's flux cord wire. So you know, if you see a T, that means it's a flux cord wire. If it was MIG, it would be an S, it would be solid. Uh, dash 1, the 1 is the usability of the electrode. M means the gas. For this particular one, it's a mixed gas instead of like a CO2. So uh, we'll get out in the lab. We'll do this T joint. We'll do the lap joint. And we'll show you how to set this uh, machine up. This is our machine setup. We'll go down here and show you the wire feed and the voltages here. Main two adjustments for this uh, flux cord process. And uh, we're, we're doing it on 3 16 plate, 045 wire, you can see we're right around 23 for our voltages, our voltage, and uh, 324 for our wire feed speed, that's in inches per minute. What we'll do now is we'll uh, show you the um, inside of the machine, um, kind of how that's working. Works a little bit different than MIG, we usually put a little pad on it so that it takes off any rust because you got to remember flux core doesn't have any copper on the outside of it to keep it from rusting. Uh, our cubic feet is at about 35 so cubic feet per hour is our shielding gas 75 25 uh, 35 cubic feet per hour. We turn it up a little bit just because um, of the smoke you have to put a fan in front of it so you're not breathing in any fumes and it might suck some of the shielding out so we turn it up a bit. So we'll look at the inside of the machine now. This is the inside of the machine. The first thing you're going to have to do when you go from MIG to flux cores, go right down here to your drive rolls. And you have to put knurled drive rolls in. So we already did that. You can see the drive rolls right there on the left. Those are your smooth drive rolls. So you just have to switch them to knurled. They just have little lines in them, put their little grooves that uh, help grip that wire. And then if you look at um, this thing here, that's that pad I was telling you about. It goes on the wire, it butts up against um, your unit, your uh, wire feed unit there, and it cleans it as it goes. I'll uh, pop it open, I'll show you the difference between the drive rolls here real quick. 
These are the difference in the drive rolls. The ones on the left are for reg regular MIG, and you can see there's no little bumps on the inside of them tracks. The ones on the right are the ones that we use for flux core, and that just helps push the wire along. One of the common mistakes people do is they over tighten the drive rolls. And what I did was I over tightened it, ran it for a little bit, and then I cleaned so that you could kind of see what happens, the difference between a clean um, drive roll and a dirty one. Because when you over tighten it, the flux comes out and gets into the liner and causes feedability problems. So I'll try and zoom in on the part that I clean and see if you can see the difference between uh, one that's clean and one that's not. The one that we over tightened here is on the right and you see how you can see flux in it? It's kind of whitish grayish powder. You don't want any of that to come off on the drive roll because it's going to go in the liner and cause feedability. The way that you determine the tightness of the wire is when it's coming out of the gun you should just barely be able to stop the wire from coming out when you hold it back. So you don't want to over tighten the drive roll. It's a critical error. It'll also oval the uh, wire and again make feedability not good. As you can see on the right, it's got that powder in it, and that's from over tightening. This is what a uh, flux core wire, a roll of flux core wire looks like, and you can see it's gray. It's not gold like a MIG wire because it doesn't have that copper coating. This is why if you have to store this, you need to get it in a hermetically sealed bag or somehow keep the moisture out. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to rust and the feedability is going to be awful. It's also going to suck in moisture and you're going to get all kinds of chicken tracks and wormholes which I'll show you at the end of the video what that looks like and um, you can kind of identify that defect if you get it. But this is what a roll of wire looks like. It's gray not gold. This is a look at the uh, T-joint in the uh, 1F position before we clean it up. You can see it kind of looks dirty and there's slag on it, a little bit of spatter, but it cleans up nice. I promise. Now we'll look at the uh, 2F lap joint before we clean that up. This is the lap joint we did in uh, 2F position before we cleaned it so now we'll hit it with a wire wheel and we'll show you how it cleans up real nice. I know it looks like there's a lot of spatter and things but it comes off relatively easily. All we're going to do is hit it with a wire wheel and you can see the difference. This is the uh, first fillet weld we did in the 2F position. Came out pretty good. This is actually the back side of the first one we did and I just wanted to point this out because if you look right there in the beginning that's a common flaw that has a lot of slang terms you'll hear wormholes, uh, chicken tracks, things like that and what happened was when we welded the first uh, fillet weld on the other side we quenched it and I think what happened was water came out of the uh, the crack between the two plates and gave us some chicken tracks I just wanted to point that out that's a common all that happens with flux core. We'll go to the one that came out with no chicken tracks here. This was the next one we did here and I would say the main error with this if you call it an error is the amount of spatter. It's hard fused spatter. 
usually you can wire wheel that right off but that's what it looks like you're not going to have ripples like you do with MIG or, or stack so we'll go ahead and we'll move on to the lap joint we did here this is the lap joint we did in the uh, two left position came out real nice hopefully this all gives you an idea on the principles behind uh, flux core welding Thanks for watching and subscribing to TV Weld. Well.